Good morning, everybody. First of all, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our latest results of our Erbium experiment uh, at the University of Innsbruck here at this workshop. I'm a PhD student working in the group of Francesca Ferlaino. Um, actually, she was invited to speak here, but uh, now I take over because she is uh, heavily pregnant right now. Um, and today I'm going to present you the Erbium experiment and then show you our recent results in creating polar Feschbach molecules of Erbium atoms. This is the outline of my talk. First, I will present you some motivation and applications of strongly polar uh, atomic gases. Then I will introduce you to our Erbium experiment and um, show you the anisotropy-induced Feschbach resonances, as Svetlana pointed out, from an experimentalist's point of view. Then I will switch over to the creation of strongly magnetic Feschbach molecules, how the strategy is there. And uh, then I will conclude in presenting the recent results and our future plans. So um, to study strongly um, polar atomic gases was already uh, proposed um, more than 10 years ago. And uh, the main um, um, research has been also done in the group of Tillmann Pfau in Stuttgart using chromium, where they showed that they uh, have a tunable quantum ferrofluid, where they showed the D-wave dipolar collapse. And also for theorists, spinner physics with high spin states is interesting. One of the applications thereof was the spontaneous demagnetization, also done in uh, chromium gas, where they could observe um, a transition from a ferrofluid ground state to a non-polarized ground state, where when they quenched the magnetic field to very low values. And this was in the case of chromium around uh, a few milligauss, uh, whereas for alkali atoms, this would have been around a few microgauss, and thus not really accessible in the experiment. Another very interesting topic is the observation of the einstein de Haas effect in a quantum gas, where you have, due to spin-orbit coupling um, uh, ro um, from the magnetization of the atomic gas, you get a rotation and thus a uh, uh, formation of a, of a vortex. And also um, some liquid crystal-like structures as the pneumatic and smectic phases. And I think Benjamin Leff will uh, talk a little bit more in the next talk after the break. Then, so the, these experiments or these proposals are mostly in 3D. And if you confine your atomic gas into two dimensions, um, you have a much better control on the symmetry breaking dipole dipole interaction. And um, one very nice experiment has been done in the group of David Jean and Yuni, where they showed they could stabilize the uh, scattering losses of potassium rubidium um, collisions when they changed from the three dimensional case here to a two dimensional case. Of course, the potassium rubidium is an exothermic. Uh, the, the collision is an exothermic process, so they have to take care of it. Um, another interesting thing is the observation of the roton maximum spectrum, which is up to now has been only observed in superfluid helium. Um, there you have a momentum dependent excitation. Uh, of course, if you have a pancake like trap, for low momenta, you only have to re, uh, repulsive collisions. But for higher momentum, you will also have um, attractive collisions. And this uh, makes this minimum in the excitation spectrum. Um, another proposal is to observe <laughs> self-assembled chains of dipoles. Because of the long-range dipole-dipole interaction, you will have um, interactions between different lattice and this, uh, this very long uh, chains can appear. And also uh, the observation of different quantum phases 
in optical lattices, uh, for example, the extended Fusser Halbert model for different filling factors of one half, one third, and one fourth, um, and also a very recent paper in a bilayer geometry where you have a pairing atoms and you can observe a pair superfluid or a pair supersolid state. But now, uh, let me come to our ex Erbium experiment. So Erbium is in the lanthanide series next to dysprosium, holmium, and thulium. And the orange um, highlighted elements have been Bose-Einstein condensed. And the blue ones there has been um, successfully demonstration of, of laser cooling. So uh, many of these elements have shared the same or similar properties a high magnetic moment in the case of Erbium 7 Bohr magneton. We have a high abundance of different isotopes. For Erbium, we have four bosonic isotopes and one fermionic. We have narrow transitions that we can use for cooling strategies, as we do in the mod by using this yellow transition. And uh, another aspect is a high melting point. Uh, this makes a need for uh, some. Uh, effusive cell in the experiment. So if you look at the energy spectrum, it's, this looks like uh, quite complicated. But as pointed out in earlier experiments, one can identify several laser cooling transitions that can be used. Um, I will concentrate on the blue one, the 401 nanometer transition, and the yellow 583 nanometer transition that we use in our experiment. Um, the atom is in a 3H6 ground state, and we have this submerged shell electron configuration, as Svetlana pointed out. So we have 12 4F electrons and two 6S electrons on the outer sheet. Um, these two laser cooling transitions, the blue and the yellow, excite one 6S electron, once into a singlet state, and once into a triplet state. And this is the reason why the line width is quite different. So we have 30 megahertz line width for the blue one, and uh, because of this, we use it for Siemens lowing and transversal cooling as well as imaging. And um, the yellow transition has a line width of 200 kilohertz and is narrow. And we can effectively, uh, very efficiently use it for creating the magneto-optical trap. We have many metastable states where the excited state can decay into, but for the blue transition, the decay probability is not so high and doesn't matter. And for the yellow transition, we have only two possible decay channels. And there, it's also neglectable. OK, then we created our magneto optical trap using the yellow transition. And typical conditions are uh, 2 times 10 to the 8 atoms with a temperature of roughly 20 microkelvin. The Doppler temperature for, for this narrow transition would be around um, 4 microkelvin, so we don't see any subdoppler sub cooling. And we could create a mod for uh, altogether these five different isotopes. Um, one nice aspect about using this narrow line transition is, so we needed to detune the laser, uh, the, the, the mod light, quite far because we saw some, some effect of the Siemens lowing beam on the trapped mod in the center. So by detuning the light, we displaced the atomic cloud. And um, so we are much further below the center. And by this, the atoms preferably scatter the sigma minus polarized light coming from below. And we get automatically a fully spin polarized sample without any repumper. So we tested this in the optical dipole trap. Without any radio frequency, we see a pure sample in the MJ equals minus 6 state. And switching on the radio frequency, we can distribute between all the 13 states. Then um, loading into the optical dipole trap and performing evaporative cooling enabled us just last year to create the first was Einstein condensate of erbium. You see here the phase transition. And uh, we have a very efficient 
cooling for the isotope 168 because this one has a quite preferable background scattering length of 180 A0. The, me the measurement of the background scattering length was done by a cross-dimensional thermalization measurement. And uh, this is the reason why our evaporation is quite efficient. So we have an increase of the phase space density by 3.5 orders of magnitude and only a reduction of the number of atoms by one order. So we end up with our system in 2.5, uh, 2, 2 times 10 to the 5 atoms in the pure EZ. Okay, then the next thing is to investigate the flashback resonances. Uh, Svetlana pointed out, um, and it's the same as, as in the case of dysprosium, that the bosons don't have a nuclear spin, and so we have no hyperfine structure. This means in a stretched state, we have only one scattering channel, and for low temperatures, this would mean we don't have any Feschbach resonances. But we have the anisotropic von der Waals potential, the dispersion interaction, and also the magnetic dipole-dipole interaction. And this gives a coupling among many partial waves, and we should be able to see, to observe a Feschbach spectrum. So this is a similar plot as, as Svetlana showed for the different terms dependent on the interatomic distance for a delta C6 value of roughly 200 atomic units, where the C6 value is roughly 1,600 atomic units. Um, okay, so having this in mind, this is a calculation done by Svetlana, especially for, this is now for, for the 166 isotope with a temperature of 30 nanokelvin. And as she pointed out, in theory, you can switch off the interactions very easily without any delta C6, so without this anisotropic um, um, Van der Waals potential term, we see this red spectrum. And uh, when switching on all the interactions and calculating up to uh, partial waves of uh, 10, we see the black spectrum. So it changes a lot of uh, the, the density of state of Feschbach resonances is quite different. And uh, we made a scan up to three Gauss, I have to point out. And you see here the atom losses dependent on the magnetic field. And we see six resonances up to three Gauss. Um, this was done at a temperature roughly around 2 microkelvin. And you see um, different kind of flashback resonance or different kind of losses. These two, for example, are narrow, and, or these three are narrow and uh, asymmetric. And you see here quite broad ones, so to say. And um, continuing this magnetic field scan, uh, up to higher fields, then reveals um, this dense spectrum. This was a scan up to 30 Gauss, and we see many resonances. So every loss, the resolution here is not so extremely good. Sometimes you only see one point per resonance, but you see a dense spectrum. We did another scan up to 10 Gauss with a higher resolution. Um, and I want to point out here, for example, because this is done at, at a higher temperature of 2 microkelvin. And for this scan, we used an atomic sample at lower temperatures, like 350 nanokelvin for the 168 isotope. And we see that some resonances disappear, for example, this one and that one. Um, and also, we noticed that this broad resonance at 2.5 Gauss is actually two overlapping resonances, right? very close to each other. Um, so a full assignment of, of these resonances as used from alkali metals um, might be not feasible or maybe even impossible. One could specify uh, the partial wave number at which the resonant starts to appear if you include it for uh, in the calculations, but um, 
this also changes, so, so um, taking more and more partial waves into account changes the, the spectrum quite a lot and you, you see uh, quite a large shift of the resonance spectrum. So another approach would be to try to see if, if a statistical approach works, as studied in, in the group by, of, of John Bone. And what we did is take the spectrum and assign the position and the width of the resonances. Then um, calculating a histogram of the width in red and uh, of, of the width in blue and the distances in red for the two different isotopes, 168 and 166. And now calculating uh, the mean distance, let's one conclude to the density of states, which is one over the mean distance actually. This is roughly the same for both isotopes. So it's one per Gauss. And then one can calculate this ratio. So gamma bar is the mean width divided by um, the mean distance. And if this is much smaller than one, then the resonances are resolvable. And this ratio is in our case uh, around 0 0.1. So although we have seen that some resonances uh, overlap, and of course this depends on, the, um, on your magnetic field step when, when scanning. So this shows that it might not be um, a good idea to use a statistical approach, but another uh, property to, to determine if this is um, usable or not, as pointed out in the paper of Michael Mayle, um, for the classical, so uh, the classical distribution, one sees a Poissonian distribution of the distances, the blue curve, whereas for, in the case of uh, quantum chaotic behavior, a uh, Wigner Dyson distribution is more applicable. And uh, fitting these two curves gives an adjusted R square, which is not so different. So, I mean, <laughs> it's larger, yeah? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, um, one thing is, I mean, the, the drop-off at, at low distance or at small distances might be an indicator for this. Um, but of course, uh, this few data points in a histogram does not really uh, tell very much and we won't need to take more data. But might be an indicator. So now let me show you how we create our strongly magnetic mole Feschbach molecules. So taking the, the easy picture of a, of a Feschbach resonance, um, one has the entrance channel and the closed channel which can be detuned. And of course you should end up with a, a molecular state with a, yeah, a binding energy. So you can create two free atoms to a molecular state and in principle you should be able to measure the binding energy. And a simple approach when looking at <coughs> The magnetic moment combining two atoms with seven Bohr magneton, one should end up with roughly 14 Bohr magneton in the, in the best case. And um, so we did. We used the resonance at 910 milligauss and uh, um, prepared the atomic sample from low magnetic field values at a given magnetic field. And then we did the so-called wiggling spectroscopy, which means one tries to, to drive the transition from the free state to the bound state by using electromagnetic fields. Um, these are two uh, spectra that we get for these two different magnetic field values. And we can extract the magnetic moment of the molecular state. Yeah. And uh, this is, in, our, in this case, at 910 milligauss, roughly 11.4 Bohr magneton. Uh, repeating this for many other resonances, we are able to see um, altogether five molecular states with different magnetic moments. And the highest one is here at 11.8 Bohr magneton, which leads to a dipole dipole interaction length of 1100 <coughs> A naught. And as I pointed out earlier, 
that this resonance here disappears for lower temperatures. And we did the Wigglin spectroscopy at low temperatures. We haven't been able to have a coupling between the atomic state and molecular state at these temperatures. But it, point, uh, it, it appeared, uh, surprisingly, at higher magnetic field values, for example, where, where this molecular state emerges, we could couple from the free um, atomic state to this molecular state. Um, but we're not sure why this happened or why this was, was possible. Um, usually only in, in, in a very close to the resonance, the coupling is strong enough so that you can drive the transition and measure the magnetic moment. Um, another idea would be to drive a bound-to-bound -bound transition. This we tried for uh, just recently, just last week, for this molecular state. So we have information about uh, the molecular state, and we know that there exists one. Uh, um, and first, the comparison to other experiments of the dipole-dipole interaction length if you take this for the highest magnetic moment of ergon 2 and compare it to the potassium rubidium experiment, you see these are similar length scales. Of course, the potassium rubidium experiment is limited due to the electric field which polarizes the molecules. So we are roughly here for ergon 2, a little bit lower actually, because the dipole moment is not the maximum of 14 MeV, as we see. And here you see, of course, many other heteronuclear molecules. Um, so then we try to create a pure molecular sample by using this resonance at 900 milligauss. We started above the resonance and then ramped the magnetic field to a lower value to enter this molecular state. And we tested this by using a stern gerlach type experiment to split uh, spatially the two clouds. And we see the residual atoms, the number of 2 times 10 to the 5, and the created molecules, the number of 3 times 10 to the 4. And in the experiment, we clean our uh, we clean away the, the residual atoms by using a blue resonant laser beam, which is shine in with a duration of only one microsecond to reduce heating in the cloud. So finally, we end up with a pure molecular sample in the optical dipole trap with 3 times 10 to the 4 molecules at a temperature of roughly 200 nanokelvin. And what we can do with this is to study dimer-dimer collisions. So this is one uh, sample curve. And we measure the two-body loss rate coefficient, L2. This is done at 0.4 Gauss, which has this value of 7.3 times 10 to the minus 11 cubic centimeters per second when fitting a pure two-body decay curve. And this is true in our case. So we don't see any one-body contribution because of residual atoms or so, this is really a good fit using this rate equation. And uh, I point out here a short lifetime of the molecules of roughly 40 milliseconds. So um, going closer to the resonance, so this is B minus B0, uh, the distance from the resonance, going closer to the resonance at 900 milligauss, we see an increase of the two-body loss rate coefficient, which is not so surprising as seen in, in, in other alkali experiments. But the surprising thing is happens here. Uh, and um, one can see it more easily when changing the magnetic field into a scattering length, taking these values for the Feshbach resonance, so 180 and not, and then roughly 900 milligauss, and the width of 38 milligauss. We see first an increase, dependent on the scattering length, a linear increase, roughly, and then a, a saturation. And this saturation of the, of the 
loss rate coefficient is up to our knowledge not really seen in other experiments for pure dimer dimer collisions. One um, possibility to, to explain it might be that at this low scattering length, the, the size of the dimer is small compared to the dipole dipole interaction length, whereas here in this part, it's already comparable. So you might not, you can treat it as, as two molecules colliding, but there might be higher orders included. And uh, I also have to point out that because we, we don't know very precisely these values, when one changes these values, this uh, saturation behavior still stays visible. So for example, taking 150 A naught, um, this changed a little bit uh, the slope of it, but we still see this linear or this, this constant threshold of the of the two-poly loss rate. Okay, so let me now come to the conclusion and the outlook. I showed you that we have been able to create flashback molecules with a high magnetic moment in a three-dimensional dimensional trap. The highest magnetic moment observed was 11.8 Bohr magneton, and there might be an onset of the statistical treatment of our flashback uh, spectrum visible. And the next steps are to create a 1D lattice and load the molecules into the lattice to stabilize um, the molecules and have a hopefully longer lifetime than uh, 40 milliseconds, and then reveal quantum chaotic distribution if this is possible by doing a, also a scan at higher B fields and um, looking closer to, to some of the resonances if they are overlapping or not. Finally, I want to show you our team. So it's Francesca Farleino as our uh, group leader, then Kyotaka and Michael as two postdocs. Simon will restart his PhD soon, and we have two master students, Alex and Michael, and it's always nice to have Rudy around for discussions. <laughs> I was also surprised. <laughs> No, there's half a meter between uh, here and there. <laughs> okay, thank you for your attention. Did you uh, try measuring the free body recombination rate for your losses in the free gas? At all? No, not yet. No, three body uh, studies was not, was not done yet. Exactly, yeah. So this will, would be proportional to A and then this, this the resonance behavior. The mm -hmm. the yeah, I know, but we did not yet do it. So the, uh, the data was two weeks ago. I mean, it's, I don't think that we can directly observe it in our system. Um, and one would need to go to, to smaller lattice spacings. Yeah, yeah our, our 1D lattice will now be done with uh, 1064 light. No, I don't think that we can observe it. And it's not really... I mean, it's one, one interesting idea, maybe in, in other systems. It, it would break up. So,
Exactly. So, so, so in the um, in the beginning, when we started these measurements, and we did not have a proper trap, um, the density was was too high, and we saw still some residual um, atoms inside. We saw here a resonance. <laughs> Uh, we, it, 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 it uh, seemed to be a resonance, but finally uh, this was an artifact. Uh, after preparing the, uh, an ice trap, we only saw something like this, but it might be that it's everything out. Yeah. Because of... Of course. All the we will contribute. So if, if the statistical, if the statistical treatment uh, does not hold for atoms, then maybe for molecules. The statistical treatment of, of resonances maybe holds for, for molecules, for diamond-diamond collisions. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so this is this is handled by this. Yeah. So the, the the initial idea from this paper by Michael Mail was to to look at uh, I think potassium and potassium rubidium collisions, which also has a very dense structure. And yes. Tetramere. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, to me, of course, they are not satisfactory because of all this close lifetime space. Yeah. Can you comment a little more about this position to the one to the actual positive side of this resolution to make lifetime stronger? I mean, of course, you, you, you confine your, your, your atomic sample and uh, you should prevent these collisions, so, and uh, the repulsive, uh, attractive collisions. How much? Um, uh, how much the, the life then will be? I mean, we're happy about everything which is larger than 40 milliseconds. Um, but I don't know an estimate right now. Um, I mean, the, it depends on the, on, on, the, on the trap that you use. And usually there, something above, let's say, 200 milliseconds or so would be, would be fine. Yeah. The longer, the, be the better, of course. Yeah. Yes. In, in that sense, you know, that's also a huge averaging factor mm -hmm. because, you know, in, in the trap, you know, so it's different energy states throughout the trap. Mm -hmm. So do you expect the statistical model to work well at low temperatures or high temperatures? Or do you expect anything to happen? So as more and more resonances appear for higher temperature, it might be even better. Yeah. Or might be um, 
better to use the statistical treatment. But it's not really something that we are, we are planning to do. It's just <coughs> to see if we are in this regime, but it turns out that we are maybe in an intermediate case. Some resonances are overlapping, but they are still a resolvable structure in between. Thank you.